Good evening, Dr. Uma. Good evening, Dr. Preeti. Good evening, Dr. Good evening. Dr. Uma. Uh, so we can start? Yes, please. Yeah, okay. Ramya? Yes, sir. You uh, can start, please. Okay, ma'am. Good evening, respected professors. Uh, I'm presenting the case of Krishna Devi, 80 year old Hindu female, resident of Panipat and homemaker by profession, educated up to middle school and belonging to lower socioeconomic status. She presented to the ENT OPD with the chief complaints of asymmetry of face for three days and difficulty in right eye closure for three days. History of presenting illness. Patient was apparently asymptomatic three days back when she suddenly noticed asymmetry of the face. She also noticed associated weakness on the right side of the face along with dribbling of saliva and orally taken fluids. Uh, this was also associated with deviation of the angle of the mouth to left, which was more pronounced during smiling. There were no relieving factors. The patient also developed difficulty in right eye closure since three days, sudden in onset and non-progressive. She could close her right eye only on applying maximum force. This was not, not associated with foreign body sensation or dryness or redness of eyes. There were no aggravating or relieving factors. There is no history of head trauma, no history of recent ear discharge, swelling or pain behind the ear, no history of ringing sensation in the ears, dizziness, fever, vomiting or neck visibility, no history of blurring of vision, double vision, reduced eye movement or loss of taste, no history of weakness of limbs, difficulty in walking or swaying while walking, no history of reduced sensation over face and body. No history of fever, cough, skin rash or myalgia. No history of vesicular eruption or swelling over face. No history uh, of sneezing, runny nose, nasal obstruction, snoring, mouth breathing and upper respiratory tract infection. No history of evening rise of temperature, chronic cough, significant weight loss or contact with TB patients. Just a minute, Dr. Ramya. Uh, yes, ma'am. So you have a case who has a right-sided, uh, there is a difficulty in uh, opening the eyes. That's what you said. Yes, ma'am. Hmm? Yes, ma Can you just tell us why you've taken each negative history? With okay, each point, tell us why you've taken this particular negative history. Yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, I've asked for history of head trauma. Because uh, a head trauma may cause uh, uh, longitudinal transverse fractures of the facial nerve, resulting in facial uh, palsy. And I've asked for recent ear discharge, swelling or pain behind, uh, behind the ear to rule out uh, chronic otitis media and its complications, which may result in facial palsy. I've asked for ringing sensation in ear, dizziness, fever, vomiting, neck rigidity to rule out uh, labyrinthitis and uh, central nervous uh, system complications of chronic otitis media. So uh, how, would that, uh, how would that be related with your uh, case of facial palsy? Uh, Ma'am, uh, if the patient is having chronic otitis media, mm -hmm. then uh, complications may arise, like dizziness, fever, vomiting. These are intracranial complications. So associated with that, if the patient is having a facial palsy, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, a lower motor facial palsy, uh, involvement of the facial nerve uh, in the mastoid or the tympanic segment, uh, and it has an associated uh, um, a meningitis or extra dural abscess or subdural abscess or a temporal bone, uh, sorry, a temporal lobe abscess. So I'm trying to rule that out by asking this. Okay. Now, uh, when you're telling me that, uh... There is, a, you are ruling out chronic otitis media. Yes, Can you tell us how chronic otitis media causes facial palsy? What could be the uh, various methods? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, in chronic otitis media, uh, the facial nerve uh, either there uh, there are two ways by which uh, it can get uh, affected. There may be a congenital dehiscence of the facial nerve, uh, especially in the tympanic segment, which can get uh, involved, uh, resulting in facial palsy. Or there may be granulation tissues developing over the uh, facial nerve, which uh, causes edema of the facial nerve and hence uh, facial palsy. And uh, there may also be invasion of uh, the fallopian canal, uh, which ultimately invades the facial nerve, uh, resulting in facial palsy. So actually, uh, inflammatory edema, it can yes, cause sir. thrombophlebitis of the vasa nervosa and cause thrombosis and uh, ischemic changes in the facial nerve. 
Yes, ma'am. Also, the toxins release can cause demyelination of the facial nerve. And of course, as you rightly said, first is that, that there is bony erosion and direct involvement of the facial nerve. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so Ramya, I just, um, uh, Dr. Preeti has said uh, the word, but you said invasion. So bony erosion would be a better word rather than saying invasion. Okay, yes, because we are, uh, we mean to say that the cholestatoma or is causing the bony erosion. Okay, not yes, invasion. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, I've asked for weakness of limbs, difficulty in walking and swaying while walking. To rule out uh, upper motor neuron causes of uh, facial nerve palsy. Uh, and uh, similarly, I've asked for reduced sensation over face and body. I've asked for history of fever, cough, skin rash, and myalgia, which is commonly seen in Lyme's disease. Uh, uh, patients with Lyme's disease may present with facial palsy. I've asked for vesicular uh, eruptions and uh, to rule out herpes zoster uh, urticus and swelling over face. Uh, which may, uh, which is helping to rule out parotid swellings. And I've asked for associated uh, uh, sneezing, runny nose, nasal obstruction, snoring, mouth bleeding, uh, to rule out any nasopharyngeal mass, which is causing eustachian tube dysfunction, which is then causing uh, a chronic otitis media, and uh, ultimately, um, uh, as a as a complication of that, patient is having uh, CON, and as a complication of CON, patient is having Patient fancy. I've also asked for, uh, I've tried to rule out tuberculosis uh, by asking for evening rise of temperature, chronic cough, significant weight loss, or contact with TB patient. Uh, can I continue? Okay. Can you just go back uh, one slide? Yes, ma'am. One slide. Yeah. Further back. Okay. Uh, what about the discharge in uh, those things? Did I miss it? Just go back. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Okay. So the presenting complaint is this only. Yes, ma'am. This is the presenting complaint. Okay, okay. Uh, next is the past history. Patient has no history of similar complaints in the past. And the patient had a history of right ear discharge since uh, childhood, moderate in amount, found smelling, mucopurulent in nature, non blood stain, aggravated by water entering the ear, and relieved on oral and topical medication. Patient had one or two episodes each year. Uh, each episode lasting for around seven to ten days, and the last episode of ear discharge was eight years ago. Patient also has hist uh, history of decreased hearing in both ears, right more than the left, for the past twenty years, which was in serious in onset, gradually progressive. Initially, patient had difficulty in hearing soft sounds, and it gradually progressed to uh, uh, difficulty in hearing routine conversational sounds. No history of improved hearing in noisy environment, and there are no aggravating or relieving factors. There is no history suggestive of tuberculosis, hypertension, type 2 diabetes mellitus, heart disease, blood transfusion, or drug allergy. No history of surgical procedures in the past. Uh, the patient is having, going back to your this thing, the patient has been having, uh, uh, you say that uh, he has decreased hearing since yes, uh, the past 20 years. Yes, ma'am. And is continuing to have decreased hearing. Yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, we can attribute it to the age-related decreased hearing because she's an 80-year-old female. Uh, possibly that is one of the reasons she's having decreased hearing. My uh, this thing is that uh, the patient is. This is a problem which the patient continues to have even at this moment. Yes, ma'am. It's not something that is in the past. Uh, like, okay, your ear discharge stopped eight years back. That is possible. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma uh, okay, ma'am, I should have included it in the uh, presenting in this. Uh, ma'am, but the patient actually, she just came with the uh, deviation of uh, angle of mouth. I understand and... that. But yes, ma'am. 
to say that the patient is having hearing loss since 20 years and is continuing to have hearing loss. Okay, ma'am. That's my take. Okay, ma'am. Ma'am, I'll include it in the uh, presenting complaints, ma'am. Yes, you. I think you should include it in the presenting complaints. Okay, ma'am. Any other positive history you would like to take in your presenting complaints? Uh, you say that the patient has sudden onset of facial weakness on one side. Yes, ma'am. With the difficulty in opening eyes and difficulty in uh, there is dribbling of saliva. Yes, ma'am. Any other positive history you would like to take? Related to her current problem. Uh, ma'am, presently, ma'am. Uh, yes. So I would advise you to take history of synchronesis also. Okay, ma'am. And your okay, history is three days older. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, treatment history. Patient had been taking treatment for ear discharge in the form of oral medication and topical medication on and off since childhood. But for the present complaints, she has not yet uh, consulted any doctors. Personal history. Uh, patient follows a vegetarian diet. Sleep is regular. Appetite is normal. Bowel and bladder habits are normal. No history of tobacco or alcohol consumption or smoking. Menstrual and obstetric history. Patient attained, men attained menopause at the age of 53 years. And obstetric formula is P4L4. Family history. There's no history of similar complaints in the family members and no history of diabetes, mellitus, hypertension, or tuberculosis in the family members. General examination. A patient is conscious, cooperative, and oriented to time, place, and person. Patient is moderately built and nourished. Vitals are as follows. Pulse rate is 80 per minute in the right arterial artery, regular in rhythm, character, and condition of the vessel wall is normal. All peripheral pulsations are felt equally bilaterally, and there's no radio radial or radio femoral delay. Blood pressure is 156 by 98 millimeter of mercury in the right bronchial artery in the sitting position, and respiratory rate is 16 per minute for active abdominals. Patient is afebrile on touch. Uh, pallor, icterus, sinosis, clubbing, generalized lymphadenopathy, and fetal edema are absent. And on examination of uh, skin and face, the uh, hair. Oh, sorry, skin is normal and hair is normal, and there's deviation of angle of mouth to the left, and there is loss of right nasolabial fold. On systemic examination, cardiovascular system, S1, S2 sounds are heard, there are no murmurs. Respiratory system, normal vesicular breath are uh, heard with no added sounds. Full abdomen soft, no organ in the gallery. Uh, for central nervous system examination, higher mental function in the form of uh, um, uh, memory, intelligence, and uh, language are normal. Motor system, uh, I have uh, tested the tone of uh, the upper and uh, lower limbs, the flexors and extensors, all of them are normal. And uh, all the reflexes, that is a superficial and uh, the uh, deep and reflexes are normal. Sensory system, uh, the sensory, uh, sensory sensations of the spinal thalamic and the posterior column, that is uh, pain, temperature, pressure, and uh, 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 proprioception and fine touch are normal. Examination of the cranial nerves. Uh, so examination of cranial nerve um, one is normal. Uh, that is the olfactory nerve. Uh, cranial nerve, uh, top, uh, the second cranial nerve, the visual activity bilaterally is uh, at finger counting at three meters. The visual field is normal. Pupils are reactive and color vision is normal. Uh, on examination of the third, fourth and the sixth cranial nerve, Bilaterally, pupillary reflexes are present and extraocular movement uh, is normal with full range of movement. Uh, examination of uh, the trigeminal nerve, the sensory and the motor uh, functions are intact with the jaw jerk absent. On examination of the facial nerve uh, on the right side, there's loss of wrinkling of forehead and patient is unable to raise eyebrows. Complete uh, eye closure or maximum force is there on the right side. And there is loss of uh, the right nasolabial fold. On the left side, there is deviation of angle of mouth to the left, and the rest of uh, the functions are normal. Examination of the eighth cranial nerve uh, is normal. 
And uh, similarly, the 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th cranial nerves are normal on the examination. Uh, next is ENT examination. Examination of ear. So um, the examination of uh, ear was done first without speculum, then with speculum, and then with the help of an otoscope. So preauricular region is normal in the right eye, uh, right ear. Pinna, postauricular region is normal. Tragal sign is absent, and the external auditory canal is uh, clear, and uh, there is no discharge. In the left ear, the preauricular, pinna, postauricular region is normal. Tragal sign is absent, and the external auditory canal is clear with no discharge. Uh, on examination of the right tympanic membrane. In the pars placida, there is grade two pars placida retraction, and uh, uh, the pars tensa. I'm sorry, the pars tensa is intact with a uh, intact cone of light. And in the left tympanic membrane, the pars placida is intact with grade two. I'm sorry, uh, with grade two pars tensa retraction, and the left tympanic membrane is also intact. On doing the tuning fork tests, uh, in the right ear and in the left ear, uh, first talking about the right ear. The release test is negative for 256 and 512 hertz and positive for 1024 hertz. In the left ear, the release is negative for the two, for 256 hertz and positive for 512 and 1024 hertz. The Weber's test is lateralized to the right and the absolute bone conduction in both ears is less as compared to the examiner. Uh, next is facial nerve function. Uh, a facial nerve examination. So, uh, comparing the right and the left side, uh, at rest, there is facial asymmetry. There is obvious but not disfiguring uh, difference between both the, two, uh, both the sides. Uh, the, uh, all, the, um, all the functions of the muscles are first done passively and then actively against resistance. So, on frowning, there is reduced wrinkling on the right side and normal on the left. Uh, patient is uh, uh, there is reduced lifting of eyebrow on the right side and normal on the left. Eye closure is complete on maximal effort on the right side and normal on the left. Smiling, teeth clenching. Uh, there is a deviation of angle of the mouth to the left. And when asked to inflate mouth to there, a uh, patient has difficulty in doing so on the right side. Uh, next is fistula test, which is negative uh, on the right side as well as the left. Spontaneous nystagmus is absent, mastoid tenderness is absent, and tests of balance like Romberg's test and Untenberg's test, dysdiorokinesia, are all normal. On examination of the nose, uh, the external framework, that is the root, bridge, dorsum, tip, are normal. There is no caudal dislocation, and the vestibule is normal. On anterior rhinoscopy, there is mild DNS to left with spur on the right, and on pole spatula test, there is equal listing bilaterally. On posterior endoscopy, uh, it, uh, normal. it is normal. On examination of oral cavity and oropharynx, mouth opening is adequate and orodental hygiene is adequate. Uh, the lips, the labial mucosa are normal. The gingival labial and the gingival buccal sulcus are normal. Patient is partially adentulous. Uh, bilateral retromolar type trigone, hard palate, soft palate, uvula, uh, tongue, the anterior two third and the posterior one third, along with the tongue movements are normal. Bilateral anterior pillar, posterior pillar, tonsillar fossa, and posterior pharyngeal wall are normal. An examination of neck, the laryngeal framework uh, is normal with uh, present laryngeal crepitus. There is no cervical lymphadenopathy, and trachea is central. So, the provisional diagnosis for this patient is uh, right lower motor neuron facial palsy with house Brachman grade 3, with right chronic otitis media squamous inactive, with right moderate mixed, and left mild mixed hearing loss. Okay, going back to your findings, you have a, um, you said there is a right-sided, uh, right-sided uh, parse plastic retraction grade 2. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Can you please elaborate and tell us what yes. is this, um, how have you graded it and what grading classification this uh, system is this? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Man, for pl pars placida, we have TOS grading system. Uh, grade one is attic dimpling. Grade two is uh, refraction of the pars placida up to the neck of the malleus. 
grade three is uh, there is partial scoodal erosion and the fundus of the retraction pocket is visible. And grade four is uh, there is definite scoodal erosion and the fundus of uh, the retraction pocket may not be visible. Okay. Uh, okay, so you are saying um, that's the only finding in the ear, no? Yes, ma'am. Just a uh, grade two retraction in the pars placida. Yes, ma'am. Any other specific thing you would like, like to comment on, which was negative? Uh, ma'am, uh, the nose and uh, there were no specific no, in the ear. In the nose, in the ear, ear ma'am, there was no other uh, in the uh, right ear. There was no other uh, findings. However, in the left ear, there was a grade two pars tensor retraction, and pars placida was normal. Okay. So, how would you explain the discharge? The patient uh, had discharge. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, possibly the patient uh, must be having uh, a retraction pocket with uh, uh, debris, which would. Uh, uh, which would get infected on water entering the ear. But with time, uh, the traction pocket has become self-cleaning. And as a result of which, the squ squamous disease, which had been uh, active previously, has now become inactive. And since the last last eight years, she's not having any ear discharge, uh, possibly because of that. So on what basis are you classifying it as a squamous disease? Uh, Ma'am, uh, the reason being she has history of foul smelling ear discharge and uh, uh, it was uh, um, scanty to moderate in amount. And uh, there is also a grade two pars placida retraction. So uh, a retraction pocket with uh, no discharge uh, is classified as a squamous disease inactive. So because of that reason, I have classified it as uh, the same here. So how is it that uh, she had foul smelling discharge earlier on. Yes, ma'am. It has now become dry. Yes, ma'am. How do you explain this change which has happened? Uh, since eight years, you say there is no discharge. Yes, ma'am. There is no discharge. Since that time, years. she had foul smelling discharge coming from the ear. Yes, ma'am. What could be the cause of that foul smelling discharge? Uh, ma'am, uh, there must there must be some debris getting collected in the uh, retraction pocket, which with time which uh, get, which got infected, or uh, uh, on either instrumentation of ear or watering and water entering the ear. But with time, her eustachian tube dysfunction uh, must have got uh, 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 better with time, or she must have uh, as she had consulted, she had been consulting doctors for. Uh, the same previously, and they must have advised her some uh, Valsalva or any other uh, 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 like uh, nasal drops or something. So with time, it has improved. And since eight years, she is not having uh, discharge because of that. Um, Dr. Ramya, it would have been better if you could have uh, given us an endoscopic picture of the yes. um, ear findings. Yes, See, oh, because uh, there was no congestion, nothing. No, ma'am, no congestion. It was an inactive disease. When she came yes. to us, there was wax in the attic. So uh, we cleaned it. We did an uh, uh, examination under microscope and we cleaned it. And we found it was a surprise. We found a Grade two retraction. There was no congestion, no discharge, no debris, and uh, it was uh, it was just an inactive uh, retraction pocket, ma'am. And that too, uh, just a grade two. Yes, ma'am. So, how do you explain an inactive discharging, inactive squamosal disease, which has been there since childhood, and yes, uh, like now it's inactive since the past eight years, you say? And since three days, the the patient is having facial pads. Yes, ma'am. So, ma'am, we can uh, come to a few differential diagnoses by this time. Uh, the most, uh, uh, I would like to keep uh, idiopathic facial palsy as the first differential diagnosis for this patient, as it was sudden in onset and uh, uh, 
there was no previous history of such uh, palsies before and no family history also and uh, she has no history of fever uh, or earache or recitals over the uh, external artery canal or any parotid swelling so uh, we um, we after getting a radiological investigation first to do uh, we can come to this conclusion that uh, 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 it is idiopathic uh, for this patient uh, we went for all the routine checkup uh, no, we'll come to the investigations time. later. Okay. Uh, yeah, just on the basis of your examination and history, how would yes. you explain the patient now? You said th there is no family history of similar disease. So, yes, there is no. what do you mean by that? The patient now, palsy, uh, would run in the family? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, in literature, it's, it is written that Bell's palsy does run in families. So, uh, that is why I mentioned that. Uh, Okay, if you're thinking in terms of Bell's palsy, then you mean to say that yes, there is yes. no previous history and not no one in the family. Yeah, but yes, I sir. think she must be the eldest in her family. Still. Okay. And uh, why are you saying this moderate mixed and mild mixed? Uh, now because in the right ear, she's having a... Uh, 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 512 hertz uh, uh, genie folk te uh, genie test as uh, uh, negative. So she's having mixed hearing loss along with, uh, sorry, she's having conductive hearing loss. And on doing absolute bone conduction test, she's having uh, 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 the absolute bone conduction is less as compared to the examiner. So it is uh, moderate and mixed in the right ear. But in the left ear, she's having. Uh, uh, negative tuning fork renaise at 256 hertz and uh, absolute bone conduction is less as compared to the examiner even on the left side. So it is mixed hearing loss in that ear too. So can you explain to us the, now we are just wanting you to link up everything. Supposing now you say yes, that uh, you have right chronic otitis medias formus inactive with right moderate mixed and left mild mixed hearing loss okay so you are yes, saying that we are dealing with two entities to simplify yes, what you're trying to say yes, ma'am. now okay coming back to your right chronic otitis media with right moderate mixed and left mild mix can you explain to us how this hearing loss has happened can you explain the moderate the mixed hair component of this hearing loss okay ma'am um, I'm in the right ear. Uh, she no, must you must tell us how the mixed component would have happened. Okay, ma'am. The conductive component uh, could be because of tympanosclerosis. And, but your case uh, doesn't health. have tympanosclerosis. Uh, ma'am, in the middle ear, maybe we are not able to visualize it on uh, 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 on otoscopy. Maybe in the middle ear on the ossicles. Uh, maybe in the epitympanum. Possibly there may be tympanosclerosis, which is not visible to us on otoscopy. And uh, that may be the cause of conductive hearing loss. And uh, the uh, sensory neural component, uh, seeing the age of the patient, it, uh, I, I, I think it would be uh, because of uh, presbycusis. And uh, uh, as presently she's not having any active disease, uh, we cannot attribute it to, uh, to the disease itself, to the, present, to the disease itself presently. But uh, the conductive can be because of the tympanosclerosis and the sensory neural because of her age. Can otitis media cause sensory neural hearing loss? And if uh, so, yes, ma how? Uh, Ma'am, through the uh, round window and uh, oval window, the various bacterial toxins that are released can enter the inner ear and cause sensory neural hearing loss. Mm -hmm. Apart from that, uh, labyrinthitis and uh, um, uh, serous or uh, Pulmonary uh, labyrinthitis can also cause sensory neural hearing loss. Okay. Any other cause? A possible cause? Uh, uh, Ma'am, a uh, labyrinth, a uh, labyrinth and fistula can also cause uh, sensory neural hearing loss. Ma'am, that you said, no. So it could be a labyrinth and fistula. It could be a labyrinthitis or. Possibly if some autotoxic drugs were used at the time of uh, when she was discharge, having active discharge, that could yes, be uh, this thing. So you feel that sensory neural hearing loss uh, 
Ma'am, it could be during the time of the active disease that she was having. Uh, the the drug that she attributing it only to age. Uh, Ma'am, it could be because of both age as well as the disease and the treatment given. Also, the conductive element uh, only tympanosclerosis could be the cause. There could uh, an ossicular uh, erosion, ossicular chain erosion could be the cause. Uh, ma'am, ossicular chain erosion could also be a cause. Yes, ma'am, it could be. Anna, because uh, if you are explaining it uh, that uh, retraction pocket uh, with uh, squamosal, so it can be an ossicular erosion. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And you and also, sorry. Yeah, also uh, you uh, with this uh, moderate mixed uh, hearing loss, still you found that uh, the eighth nerve was normal. You commented that eighth nerve is normal. Uh, yes, With the ticking watch test. Yes, ma'am. She could hear it. I'm kept very close to the ear. Uh, she could uh, hear that. But it was kept very close to the ear, not the usual. What was kept very close to the ear? Uh, Ma'am, the ticking watch test that we did for the patient. No, beta. If you have going back to your cranial, Dr. Nilima has pointed out a very important thing. Aap, apna jaye, uh, could you show us your examination of the cranial nerves? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, next. Achha, you mentioned by ticking watch test. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so but there is a standard distance where you would keep yes. Uh, yes, the watch, and uh, yes, so you can't say if you have changed any uh, condition uh, of the test, then you can't say normal. Okay. Yes. Okay. This okay. Should, uh, ha, this is important. Up either normal or not. Okay. Okay, so the uh, the presentation of the case is a little um, uh, what should I say? Three days of facial nerve and uh, the this disease is in an inactive stage, and she is an eighty years old lady. Okay, so can yes, you just summarize, and then we will proceed to the investigations. Yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, an eighty year old female presented to the ENT OPD with complaints of. Uh, uh, right-sided uh, uh, weakness of the face and deviation of angle up to the deviation of angle of mouth to the left. She has history of uh, right ear discharge, uh, foul smelling, and moderate to scanty in amount. Uh, and the last episode was eight years ago. And uh, uh, coming to the provisional diagnosis of this case, uh, sorry, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, on examination, uh, there is a parse of placida grade two retraction in the right ear. And in the left ear, there's a grade two parse tensor retraction. And uh, coming to the provisional diagnosis, it is um, the right lower motor neuron facial palsy, house Brackman grade three, with right chronic otitis medius squamous inactive, with right moderate mixed and left mild mixed hearing loss. Why do you call okay. it house Brackman grade three? Uh, Ma'am, because uh, now on. Uh, at rest, uh, the patient did had obvious but not disfiguring uh, deformity of the face, and uh, the wrinkling was reduced on the uh, right side as compared to the left. Eyebrow raising was also reduced, and patient had complete eye closure on uh, maximum force, and uh, uh, minimal synkinesis was also present, and this deviation of angle of mouth to the left. So, uh, uh, taking all this in mind, uh, it comes to be house bracket grade three. So how do you plan to proceed? Uh, ma'am, to this patient, uh, ma'am, the first, uh, ma'am, first we will carry out all the routine investigations, and uh, and it is important to do an uh, examination under the microscope to completely uh, to completely visualize the retraction pocket, look for any other uh, signs of the act of active disease. After that, uh, uh, to rule out the squamous disease causing. Uh, the facial palsy, uh, an HRCT bilateral temporal bone uh, is done, and uh, 
if if uh, if on that we find any evidence of uh, erosion of uh, the facial uh, canal or any active disease then we will proceed in that side and if facial nerve uh, comes out to be the uh, the disease the squamous disease still looks to be inactive then we can proceed in the other direction and rule out other causes like uh, diabetes mellitus or hypertension or uh, hyperthyroidism or um, and after we rule out all that we can ultimately even uh, uh, get to the conclusion of uh, idiopathic facial palsy okay you said ki you will get the ct scan temporal bone and yes, it will be able to tell you whether the disease is active or inactive can a ct scan tell you uh, ma'am not that the disease active. is active or inactive uh, ma'am it will tell us about uh, whether scutal erosion is there or not if the fish, uh, fallopian canal is uh, uh, intact or not ma'am we can look for those signs and we can also look for uh, uh, any uh, or um, no okay we ct so scan we are getting this but if we want to rule out any other intracranial causes like any tumors or uh, any other any other intracranial uh, uh, causes like cp angle tumors or uh, uh, so you tell us causes, we need to do an mri for that ma'am so the hrct temporal bone we are getting is for yes, is for chronic otitis media or for ruling out an intracranial cause for facial pads uh no ma'am for this uh, for hrct was is done for the chronic otitis media and so a scutum erosion yes, a scutum erosion will point towards active disease or uh ma'am i mean why are we getting a ct done in this case ma'am we'll get a ct done to mainly look for the fallopian canal if it is a uh, Uh, Please, so you it, you know that fallopian canal can be congenital dehiscences can can also be there. So if there is a dehiscence, how will you conclude that this is because of COM? Uh, if there is supposing an erosion, then what would that indicate? Uh, now it could either be because of the cholestatoma or it can be. I mean, as you mentioned that. it can be congenital dehiscence too uh, then uh, the patient may require uh, a surgical intervention to uh, uh, to look for whether the disease is causing the facial uh, uh, inflammatory edema or not would there be any findings on ct scan which will point towards uh, com uh an active what disease else would you look for you are just concentrating on the facial nerve part uh ma'am we can look for ossicular erosion we can look for uh, yes, status of the ossicular chain then uh, mucosal edema in the mastoid air cells in the epitympanum mesotympanum uh, so soft tissue presence of soft yes, tissue ma'am. okay in the mastoid in the middle ear in the attic and the prosaic space uh mm -hmm. and if fine cuts are there and we can also look for any uh, labyrinthine fistula if fine cuts are there what what cuts would you advise in this patient um to mm to mm when you have to look for facial nerve what cuts do you advise uh high resolution aap keh rahe ho na to usme kya aap kitna advise karte ho uh mm to mm cuts are advised Yeah, one mm cuts. Two uh, mm may you okay. two mm are big for uh, HRCT. You get one mm cuts. Okay, ma'am. Okay, so um, so on examination on CT scan, we find that there is a soft tissue. uh thickening or soft tissue present in the uh attic mesotympanum and in the uh mastoid okay yes ma'am okay so and uh, other things you have already done uh you said routine investigations uh, yes, what routine investigations uh ma'am we can get uh ma'am routine like uh, uh the complete blood count patient specific patient specific uh, ma'am we can get an rbs done and hba1c done uh, 
uh, looking at mm-hmm. it, it could also be because of a diabetic status. Okay. Uh, we can also get a thyroid profile done. Hypothyroidism can one, be one of the causes. Uh, and uh, uh, her, uh, her renal function and uh, liver function tests, uh, viral markers can also be done because in HIV can also manifest as uh, uh, facial palsy. And uh, uh, if okay, so you would like to rule out the systemic causes. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. I like to. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Uh, then after CT scan, what all specific investigations? Uh, I'm after getting a CT scan. Uh, I mean, uh, MRI can be done if uh, if we are suspecting any tumor and if any other cranial nerve uh, palsy is associated. Uh, then an MR, MRI can be done, contrast enhanced MRI. And uh, Okay, apart from radiology, what investigation? Uh, now, pure, pure tone audiogram uh, has yeah. to be done uh, to yes. find out whether our findings are corroborating with the uh, with the findings of the pure tone audiogram. Is that the only purpose of getting uh, the pure tone audiogram? Uh, no, ma'am. It will tell us whether the uh, hearing loss is. Uh, um, conductive or uh, mixed, and uh, if it is so, then what is uh, how much uh, uh, quantitatively how much it is, and we can also get an impedance audiometry done to look for any ossicular uh, discontinuity, and uh, in, in some uh, patients a stipulative reflex is also done along with uh, the uh, uh, during the uh, impedance audiometry. In some patients, uh, ma'am, wherever available, ma'am. Because uh, if facial palsy, um, if a patient is having facial palsy, and uh, uh, if you want to uh, localize the site of the facial palsy, uh, uh, stipedial reflex can be assessed, ma'am. How do you localize the site of facial palsy? Uh, ma'am, uh, if it is, uh, ma'am, starting from uh, the intertemporal part, if there is any. Uh, lesion proximal to the genicular ganglia, then the declination will be affected. Um, the taste sensation and the, the uh, as well as the stapedal, uh, sorry, the stapes muscle will be affected, resulting in uh, absence stapedal reflex. And if it's in the tympanic segment, then the declination will be, uh, uh, will not be affected. While the others, like uh, the taste sensation, uh, uh, the stapes and uh, the motor fibers will be affected. If uh, the second genu and the, if the sorry, the tympanic uh, mastoid segment is affected, uh, then then similarly, depending on whether it is proximal to uh, the the branching of the stap, uh, nerve to stapedius or distal to it, the uh, stapes will stapes stapedius muscle will be uh, preserved and. Uh, if it is distal to the stylomastoid foramen, then all these proximal branches will be preserved and only the motor fibers will be affected. Okay, so can you tell us what are the uh, the topognostic tests which you will do? You've, you've said that these will be affected, this will be affected. What are yes, the tests ma'am. that you will do? Uh, ma'am, topodiagnostic tests are first is the Schirmer's test uh, in which we assess the greatest superficial petrosin nerve. And uh, it is the what is the name of the test? Shermer's test, ma'am. Shermer's, yes. Yes, ma'am. Shermer's test. We assess the greatest superficial petrosin nerve. So either Shermer's test strips or uh, sterile filter paper of size 13 to 5 mm are taken and are tucked in the lower palpebra. And we uh, keep it for around five, uh, five minutes. And then we assess uh, the amount of moistening of the filter paper. If it is less than 10 mm or less than 75 as 75 percent as compared to the opposite side, then uh, uh, there is some dysfunction on the affected side, uh, on the uh, side where uh, the moistening is less. Uh, the what are the precautions test, that you will take when you are performing this test, uh, which can affect the result of your test? Uh, the patient should not be. Uh, uh, 
uh, in a place where there is uh, too much air exposure, a patient yes. should not be having any eye infection. And we should, uh, before we are doing the test, we must uh, counsel the patient regarding what we'll be doing. And we should ask for any uh, previous watering of eyes or any other, um, uh, any other history suggestive of an obstruction in the nasal recrimin duct. So we will be getting a false uh, positive um, um, result. Um, and the second test is um, uh, and the, uh, electrogustometry. It is for assessing the um, taste sensation. So, so electrogustometry is not available. Um, Clinical test, test, what will you do? And we can assess the taste. So for that, we will ask the first we'll counsel the patient, and then we'll ask the patient to protrude the tongue out. And uh, uh, various tastes like sour, sweet, uh, uh, salt, salty, and bitter are taken. And over the uh, uh, anterior two third of the tongue, these tastes, uh, these uh, uh, solutions are placed. So first we'll clean the tongue, place that particular solution, and wait for the patient to. Uh, Identify the taste without retracting the tongue in the mouth. And if the patient is able to identify, then it is normal. Again, when you are testing the taste, what will you what will your instructions be? Uh, now we will ask the patient to uh, not take the uh, not uh, retract the tongue before he's able to he or she is able to identify it. Identify the taste. Mm -hmm. and and after every taste, uh, we will uh, clean the tongue properly. Clean it or uh, you will ask the patient to rinse the mouth? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. Hmm. Ma'am, uh, the next uh, topo diagnostic test is um, salivary flow test. So for that, we can cannulate uh, the submandibular gland duct and uh, place uh, any uh, acidic supplement, 6% like citric acid over the tongue. And we will look for uh, uh, the lacrimation, uh, the, sorry, the salivation. Uh, if there is a decrease in salivation up to 25%, then it is considered as abnormal. And uh, the next test is uh, stapedium reflex. So for this test, um, we, are, uh, we expose the patient to loud, uh, short bursts of loud sounds. And via the uh, stapedial reflex, like the, the uh, afferents are the Eighth cranial nerve and through the efferents of the seventh cranial nerve, uh, the stapes muscle will contract and uh, stapedial reflex will be uh, will be assessed. Then. Okay, so you so you must know all these uh, topognostic tests and uh, about the salivary flow test. Uh, I do not remember uh, exactly at the present time. So just check uh, this again and. Uh, so that you can re kind of reinforce it in your uh, mind all these yes, uh, tests okay yes ma'am so you are saying that basically we are so you've done your radiological tests you've done your proton audiometry yes ma'am some uh, baseline hematological tests yes ma'am so you you are telling us that basically you are dealing with the case of uh, a, a case of chronic otitis media, squamous mm -hmm. uh, inactive, and uh, when we ruled out all other causes of uh, uh, facial palsy, and we ultimately uh, uh, provisionally came to the diagnosis of idiopathic facial palsy on the right side, which is Bell's palsy. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so how will you treat her? Uh, ma'am, uh, for treatment, ma'am, we will start with uh, 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 steroids, high dose steroids, uh, uh, one mg per kg uh, per day, prednisolone for seven to ten days, and gradual tapering. Uh, we, we can also give uh, antivirals like valcyclovir or acyclovir, and uh, uh, multivitamins, vitamin C, uh, and uh, proper eye care, which includes. Uh, eye drops and uh, gels at night and proper eye patching while the patient is sleeping. And uh, physiotherapy is of utmost importance uh, starting from the first day when we started with uh, patient physiotherapy exercises. And uh, the patient was also hypertensive. Uh, so we 
uh, we started with antihypertensive agents uh, and uh, did uh, regular uh, blood pressure charting and monitoring. So let us first classify your disease. So first you said that you are going to give her steroids, one yes, agent per kg body weight. Yes, ma'am. Hmm? Yes, ma'am. And uh, uh, along with that, you are going to take care of the eye. Yes, ma'am. So care of the eye will be done by how? What 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 all uh, would you tell her to take care of the eye? Uh, ma'am, frequent installation of artificial tears in the eye. Uh, okay. Then uh, she can use uh, dark goggles and avoid exposure to very cold air or windy environment. And mm -hmm. Before she's sleeping, she needs to put uh, uh, ointments like uh, any lubricant ointments inside the, in the eye and patch the eye properly before she's sleeping. And uh, at any uh, any sign of uh, visual disturbance or irritability of eye, an ophthalmology review is a must to watch out for any corneal uh, ulceration or opacities. And eye patching. Yes, ma'am. Eye patching, ma'am. Eye patching, eye yes, patching can be done in the night. Ocular, uh, the eye drops and the ointment, they prevent escape of moisture from the eye and they maintain the high, ocular hydration. Just yes, uh, of the uh, ointment uh, has uh, is more uncomfortable, so it is generally provided. Uh, it kind of causes blurring of vision also. So, uh, ointments are generally prescribed in the night, and but the ointments the effect lasts longer. The eye drops you have to keep putting the eye drops. Yes, ma'am. And then, and then you wish to give. Uh, antivirals. Uh, multivitamins. Uh, antivirals. What antiviral? Um, uh, valcyclovir can be given, uh, or acyclovir. Valcyclovir at the dose of uh, 500 mg TDS. And if I took it 400 mg five times a day. Now. So uh, recent now literature is there are many studies which have been done, which are showing that antivirals are really not helping much when that's spells. Yes, ma'am. So currently that, of course, antivirals is a, um, it's a little bit of a um, debatable issue. But more and more studies are pointing against the use of antivirals in dense vaccine. Yes, ma'am. And what is the role of multivitamins? Uh, ma'am, uh, if uh, if there is any patient of edema and axonal regeneration is required, then uh, they help in in that. And vitamin which C is also like to have which multivitamin or which vitamin will reduce facial nerve edema or help in neuro uh, nerve regeneration. Uh, I'm the B complex and the vitamin C that is given, it has antiviral properties too. I have not, uh, vitamins reducing nerve edema or causing nerve regeneration. I'm not too sure of. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, these things have just uh, an empirical empirical evidence, no proven no evidence. What kind of a prognosis will you advise? Would you counsel the patient? Uh, now I'll counsel the patient that usually in her case, uh, there is a good prognosis. Around seventy percent of the patients will have good recovery by the end of uh, six months. Uh, she may have some residual. Uh, uh, facial asymmetry. So um, she should be well aware of that uh, from the beginning itself. And uh, uh, so for Bell's palsy, we have a better prognosis than 70%. It is about 85% uh, uh, good prognosis. Bell's palsy has a good prognosis of recovery. And six months, I think even lesser time, Yes, ma'am. I would not be dogmatic, I, but uh, yeah, less than that. Which part of the facial nerve is the most affected part in Bell's palsy? Uh, 
ma'am uh, the narrowest portion of the facial nerve that is at uh, uh, at the fundus of the internodic canal and the starting of the labyrinthine portion which is around 0.68 mm so it is this part that is the most affected uh, during breast palsy what is the role of surgery uh ma'am surgery can be done uh, uh so uh if patient presents to us uh, between days 3 and 14 and electroneurography is done and on electroneurography we find more than 90% degeneration of the nerve fibers so facial nerve decompression can be done in such a case and uh, uh, it will um, it will basically like just do electroneuronography or some other uh ma'am electromyography is done but it is uh it is done after three weeks, ma'am. If we do electromyography, mm -hmm. and, uh, within up to up to three weeks, we can do electroneurography and look for the nerve uh, uh, degeneration, the percent of nerve that is degenerated. Ma'am, mm -hmm. uh, we can uh, do facial nerve de uh, decompression for that. Uh, what approach could uh, what approach is used for that? Ma'am, usually middle cranial POSA approach is used uh, because we uh, uh, we have to approach the labyrinthine segment in such a case. So we'll be using the middle cranial POSA any approach. Any other approach that can be used? Uh, Ma'am, a transmastoid approach, translabyrinthine approach can also be used. Mm -hmm. But a translabyrinthine approach will, uh, will affect the hearing of the patient. So mm -hmm. uh, we will prefer for either a uh, transmastoid or a middle cranial POSA approach. And uh, what, in your patient, would you advise her? Uh, ma'am, for surgery? Uh, ma'am, uh, then, then after we started with uh, the treatment of the patient, within the next uh, uh, seven days, she improved drastically. Mm -hmm. From grade three, uh, she came up to uh, grade two. And then when she came after a, a three week follow up, it came to grade one. So for her, a surgery is uh, not advisable. And in any case, you are if you are planning a mid, you have to see the general condition of the patient also. Yes, ma'am. Surgery is extensive. Yeah. So uh, there are a couple of questions in the chat box. distance for the ticking watch test so ramya can you answer that uh ma'am it is uh, kept at uh around at 15 uh 15 centimeters from the external artery canal 15 centimeters i'll have to uh, check it uh, i'm not sure okay the 15 centimeter thing i'll have to check okay so you can check it and maybe at the next case presentation yes ma'am we can tell the answer okay and then uh, yubraj is saying uh, in this case very old age high dose steroid will lead to osteoporosis and steroid induced subcapsular cataract so before starting steroid need to consult yes definitely uh, age of the patient is such that uh, uh, we will uh, we will get all the referrals done and we will uh, only then we will start the steroids but uh, steroids are essential uh, in this uh, in such a case uh, so we will need to give them but we can uh, monitor and we are we will not be giving for a prolonged duration so it will be on regular follow up and uh, is it necessary to do for the density and so definitely in this uh, patient i think already there would be uh, some osteoporosis and uh, those things that is a considered risk we will have to uh, take dr preeti do you agree with me yes yes absolutely yeah yeah an ophthalmologist opinion will definitely be taken the examination will be done also for the any corneal 
involvement and uh, all those things. So ophthalmologist opinion will be taken. Facial exercises, how frequently uh, need to start? Mm, how frequently? Actually, the role of facial exercises is again and again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, you can start, but there are uh, there are studies which are saying that actually are they really helping? So that's controversial. Yeah, and uh, any role of culture sensitivity or antibiotic role in case of Bell's palsy? I think CS means culture sensitivity. So there is uh, no, no discharge and uh, most of the cases of Bell's palsy, there is no discharge. So culture sensitivity is not done. Antibiotic also, again, in Bell's palsy, we do not advise uh, antibiotic as a routine unless there is... Uh, yeah. There is no bacterial correlate to the uh, etio etiology of uh, Bell's palsy. If at all, uh, it there could be a viral etiology to it, but not a bacteria. Yeah. And something about toxic substances, uh, causes of facial palsy in CSOM, about toxic substances. Um, Preeti, I do not uh, get your question, but uh, I think uh, you are talking about ototoxic drugs that we said, which could have led to the uh, sensory neural hearing loss. About the facial palsy, I don't think we talked about any toxic substances. Ramya? Uh, no, ma'am. No, we didn't. Yeah. Dr. Uma, if you are there, uh, questions yes. from you? Uh, yes. Any questions from you? Uh, questions, uh, I just want to add one thing to the treatment. That's yes, because uh, for Bell's palsy, we say the narrowest part of the Philippine Canal is involved and ischemia may be the etiology. So if you all remember, we used to use vasodilators in the form of niacinamide and nicotinic acid along with steroids. So as said, there's no role of multivitamins, but neurotonics, vitamin B12 along with niacinamide and nicotinic acid is to, was being used. So now we are not using, but theoretically we can add to the treatment the role of vasodilators. As far as edema is concerned, that will be taken care of by steroids and not by multivitamins. I just wanted to correct that. Yes, and uh, okay. <laughs> and then one thing I want to discuss with you both is uh, that as far as history of decreased hearing is concerned, so shall we? Should we really put it in? History of present illness or past? Ma'am, we can my patient, opinion. My, because, my taking is that the patient yeah. is having hearing loss. So when yeah. we are telling negative history and all that we are telling, before that we hmm. can say that the patient also has hearing loss in both the ears. And mm -hmm. uh, this is my, I would like to present with that. Okay, 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 right. Because it is, a, it is not a past problem. It is a current, it is a problem which he continues to have. Okay. But what I thought that history of present illness is basically the history of presenting complaints in detail. So I think both things are correct or if you say we can put it in history of present illness only. Yes, ma'am. I mean, um, yeah. Dr. Neelima, what do you say? Yes, 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 uh, ma'am. I think uh, the um, it may not be her presenting complaint. Yeah. But when you ask for uh, ear discharge and uh, and if he if she says that yes, I have a decreased hearing, then it should mm. be kind of uh, put in the presenting complaints. Okay, okay, right. The discharge is now no longer there since the last eight years. Mm -hmm. So then you can. Think of it as a past okay. uh, illness. 
but uh, decreased hearing since she is suffering from decreased hearing mm -hmm. uh, so i think better to okay. include it in the presenting company yeah. rame you got it yes ma'am it's okay yes ma'am okay i think that is all or whatever yeah dr. yeah Preeti and the... so uh, yeah. dr preeti yes thank can you. we close it yes yes thank you so yeah. much Dr. Ramya, that was an excellent uh, presentation and uh, you could answer most of the questions. Well done. And uh, just that uh, next time for an ear case when, with an online presentation, if you have a, if you can manage a photograph, so that gives a better uh, idea. If yes. you attended the last case presentation, yes, uh, so it was a good photograph and uh, everyone could make out what the findings uh, were on uh, ear examination. Yes, so keep that in mind. That's all. Yeah, but it was a good, good presentation and a good discussion. Yes. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Preeti. Thank you, uh, thank you ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, thank, thank you, Dr. Shilima. And thank you, Dr. Ramya. Well done. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank bye. You. Bye. Okay.